How the Office of Postman Fell Vacant in Otford Under the Wall From Tales of Three Hemispheres by Lord Dunsinane This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman How the Office of Postman Fell Vacant in Otford Under the Wall by Lord Dunsinane. The duties of postman at Otford under the wool carried Amuel Sleggins further afield than the village, further afield than the last house in the lane, right up to the big bare wall, and the house where no one went, no one, that is, but the three grim men that dwelt there, and the secretive wife of one. And once a year, when the queer green letter came, Amuel Sleggins, the postman, the green letter always came just as the leaves were turning addressed to the eldest of the three grim men with a wonderful chinese stamp and the otford postmark and emil slagans carried it up to the house he was not afraid to go for he always took the letter had done so for seven years yet whenever summer began to draw to a close emil slagans was ill at ease and if there was a touch of autumn about, shivered unduly, so that all folk wondered. And then one day a wind would blow from the east, and the wild geese would appear, having left the sea, flying high and crying strangely, and pass until they were no more than a thin black line in the sky, like a magical stick flung up by a doer of magic, twisting and twirling away. And the leaves would turn on the tree, and the mist be white on the marshes, and the sun set large and red, and autumn would step down quietly that night from the wold, and the next day the strange green letter would come from China. His fear of the three grim men, and that secretive woman, and their lonely secluded house, or else the cadaverous cold of the dying season, rather braced Amuel when the time was come and he would step out bolder upon the day that he feared than he had perhaps for weeks. He longed on that day for a letter for the last house in the lane. There he would dally and talk a while, and look on church-going faces, before his last tramp over the lonely wold, to end at the dreaded door of the queer grey house called Wold Hut. When he came to the door of Wold Hut, he would give the postman's knock, as though he came on ordinary rounds to a house of every day, although no path led up to it, although the skins of weasels hung thick from the upper windows. And scarcely had his postman's knock rung through the dark of the house than the eldest of the three grim men would always run to the door. Oh, what a face had he! There was more slyness in it than ever his beard could hide. He would put out a grisly hand, and into it Amuel Sleggins would put the letter from China, and rejoice that his duty was done, and would turn and stride away. And the fields lit up before him, but, ominously, eager and low murmuring, arose in the wold hut. For seven years this was so, and no harm had come to Sleggins. Seven times he had gone to wold hut, and as often come safely away, and then he needs must marry. Perhaps because she was young, perhaps because she was fair, or perhaps she had shapely ankles, as she came one day through the marsh among the milkmaid flowers, shoeless in the spring. Less things than these have brought men to their ends, and been the nooses with which fate snared them running. With marriage curiosity entered his house, and one day as they walked with evening through the meadows, one summer evening, she asked him of Woldhut, where he only went, and what the folks were like that no one else had seen. All this he told her, and then she asked him of the green letter from China that had come in the autumn, and what the letter contained. He read to her all the rules of the inland revenue. He told her he did not know that it was not right that he should know. He lectured her on the sin of inquisitiveness. He quoted Parsons. 
and in the end she said that she must know. They argued concerning this for many days, days of the ending of summer, of the shortening evenings, and as they argued, autumn grew nearer and nearer, and the green letter from China. And at last he promised that when the green letter came, he would take it as usual to the lonely house, and then hide somewhere near, and creep to the window at nightfall, and hear what the grim folk said. Perhaps they might read aloud the letter from China. And before he had time to repent of that promise, a cold wind came one night, and the woods turned golden, and the plover went in bands that evening over the marshes, and the year had turned, and there came the letter from China. Never before had Amuel felt such misgivings as he went on his postman's rounds. Never before had he so much feared the day that took him up to the wold and the lonely house. While snug by the fire his wife looked pleasurably forward to curiosity's gratification, and hoped to have news ere nightfall that all the gossips of the village would envy. One consolation only had Amuel, as he set out with a shiver. There was a letter that day for the last house in the lane. Long did he tarry there, to look at their cheery faces, to hear the sound of their laughter. You did not hear laughter in Woldhut. And when the last topic had been utterly talked out, and no excuse for lingering remained, he heaved a heavy sigh, and plodded grimly away, and so came late to Woldhut. He gave his postman's knock on the shut oak door, heard it reverberate through the silent house, saw the grim elder man and his grisly hand, gave up the green letter from China, and strode away. There was a clump of trees growing all alone in the wold, desolate, mournful by day, by night full of ill omen, far off from all the other trees, as Woldhut from other houses. Near it stands Woldhut. Not today did Amuel stride briskly on, with all the new winds of autumn blowing cheerily past him, till he saw the village before him, and broke into song. But as soon as he was out of sight of the house, he turned, and stooping behind a fold of the ground, ran back to the desolate wood. There he waited, watching the evil house, just too far to hear voices. The sun was low already. He chose the window at which he meant to eavesdrop, a little barred one at the back, close to the ground. And then the pigeons came in. For a great distance there was no other wood, so numbers sheltered there. Though the clump is small, and of so evil a look, if they noticed that, the first one frightened Amuel. He felt that it might be a spirit escaped from torture in some dim parlor of the house that he watched. His nerves strained, and he feared foolish fears. Then he grew used to them, and the sun set then, and the aspect of everything altered, and he felt strange fears again. Behind him was a hollow in the wold, and he watched it darkening and before him he saw the house through the trunks of the trees. He waited for them to light their lamps so that they could not see. Then he would steal up softly and crouch by the little back window. But though every bird was home, though the night grew chilly as tombs, though a star was out, still there shone no yellow light from any window. Amuel waited and shuddered. He did not dare move till they lit their lamps. They might be watching. The damp and the cold so strangely affected him that autumn evening, and the remnants of sunset, the stars, and the wold, and the whole vault of the sky, seemed like a hall that they had prepared for fear. He began to feel a dread of prodigious things, and still no light shone in the evil house. It grew so dark that he decided to move and make his way to the window in spite of the stillness, and though the house was still dark. He rose, and while standing arrested by pains that cramped his limbs, he heard the door swing open on the far side of the house. 
He had just time to hide behind the trunk of a pine when the three grim men approached him and the woman hobbled behind. Right to the ominous clump of trees they came as though they loved their blackness, passed through within a yard or two of the postman, and squatted down on their haunches in a ring in a hollow behind the trees. They lit a fire in the hollow and laid a kid on the fire, and by the light of it Amuel saw brought forth from an untanned pouch the letter from China. The elder opened it with his grisly hand, and in toning words that Amuel did not know, drew from it a green powder, and sprinkled it on the fire. At once a flame arose, and a wonderful savor, and the flames rose higher and flickered, turning the trees all green, and Amuel saw the gods coming to sniff the savor. While the three grim men prostrated themselves by their fire, and the horrible old woman that was the spouse of one, he saw the gods coming gauntly over the wold, beheld the gods of old England, hungrily sniffing the savor, Odin, Baldur, and Thor, the gods of the ancient people, beheld them eye to eye, clear and close in the twilight, and the office of postman fell vacant in Otford under the wold. The End of how the Office of Postman Fell Vacant in Otford Under the Wool by Lord Dunsinan Madame Versailles by Melville Davison Post This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I was surprised on a morning in early February to find Bishop Simonton's carriage before Randolph Mason's house. I have known churchmen to appeal to Mason in desperate straits, perhaps upon a theory that one should try all temporal doors before knocking on the gates of alabaster, but that the aesthetic and venerable Bishop of New York should require profane assistance was quite beyond belief. I pulled up short by my ancient friend, the crossing policeman. Scully, I said, I believe the ravages of age are beginning to mark me. Can it be Bishop Simonton's carriage I see yonder? The great Celt wrapped himself gently on the belt plate with his club. Sure, he said. It's not the ravages of age that's doing you any harm this morning, Mr. Parks. Tis his nib's wagon, all right. Some alderman must be squatting on the church lands, I said, to bring this good man out at a quarter before ten on a winter morning. Waste, replied the Irish king, half covering his mouth with his gloved hand. Tis a woman. Then he crossed the street to stop a line of drays. The mystery was now beyond conjecture. I walked on slowly to the gate and up the flag path to the house. Certain airy nebulous conceptions had, from the pleasantries of early Italian letters and recent scandalous posters along the bookstalls, presented themselves with piquant explanations. Within the house a second and greater surprise awaited me. Pietro met me at the door, saying that Randolph Mason wished instantly to see me. I gave Pietro my coat and hat, and went at once to the private office. My state of mental flippancy had little prepared me for the type of woman who arose as I entered. I have not seen her like in New York. If the word elegant were not so thumbed, I should write it here as descriptive of her, not in a tinseled or bedizened sense, but as the panther is elegant, as the red silken horses of a rajah are elegant. High breeding down an immemorial line produces such animals time through a hundred generations carving carefully like a gem engraver tall supple and straight the eye steady calm reserved fearless the nose straight and thin the lips fine delicate and resolute the chin up the black glossy hair parted in the middle and brushed back she was gowned in well-fitting black this woman was perhaps fifty years old 
I instantly fitted her into the frame of a casement window along the battery in Charleston, or the white columns of an estate on the James. I bowed as she turned toward me. I think the statue of Nathan Hale, outside in the flurry of snow, would also have bowed had it been standing in my shoes. She did not speak to me at all, but waited in dignified silence for Mason to say what was necessary to be said. Mason was standing by his table, tapping it impatiently with the tips of his long, sensitive fingers. I thought the lines along his mouth were broken a bit, his eyes a trifle warmer. But this was certainly a fancy, for when he spoke it was in his usual cold, even voice. "'Parks,' he said, "'you must find a certain variety actress calling herself Madame Versailles. She has in her possession a case of pearls belonging to Miss Carolyn Pickney. She will demand ten thousand dollars in cash for the return of these jewels. You will say to her that Miss Pickney has finally arranged to pay her this money, that on the tenth day of February, at ten o'clock, the vault officer of the Jefferson Trust Company, in the city of Richmond, in the presence of Miss Pickney here and you, will deliver to her ten thousand dollars in currency. She must bring with her the case of jewels, and hand it over to the vault officer, who, upon the payment of the money, will give it to Miss Pickney. This Madame Versailles is said to be under the protection of one Robert Henderson, a police detective of New York. This person may also be present, if Madame Versailles wishes him to be. You will arrange for this purchase with Madame Versailles. You will then accompany Miss Pickney to Richmond, and be present with her at the transfer of the money. Miss Pickney will personally attend to the other details of the matter. When Randolph Mason had finished speaking, the woman picked up a long coat from her chair and began to put it on. I helped her with the collar of it. She thrust her black-gloved hands in the deep pockets, then she turned to Mason. "'These jewels were brought from India by my great-grandfather,' she said. "'They were worn by my great-grandmother at her wedding. By my grandmother. By my mother. Their value to me is beyond estimate. Still, I do not wish to violate either the laws of Virginia or those of the United States in order to recover them. I do not greatly fear the laws of Virginia.' It cannot be that my fathers have made laws that would permit a creature like this actress to retain my inheritance. But the laws of the United States are of the North. They may permit such things, I do not know. Federal judges in the South, it is said, are king's governors, often contravening, I am told, our wisest laws, our oldest customs, our most cherished ideas of justice. I do not wish to come into the presence of these overlords, nor to be subject to the impertinence of their attaches. I wish to be assured, Mr. Mason, of the entire safety of this plan. Mason's face showed annoyance. Madam, he said, a rubber of whist could not be safer. Then, said the woman, I bid you good morning. A little snow was falling, and I accompanied Miss Carolyn Pickney to Bishop Simonton's carriage, tucked in the skirts of her greatcoat, and closed the door. I think she must have taken me for a sort of upper servant, since she gave no evidence of my presence, except a stately nod at the carriage window. Here was a fine bundle of mysteries, coupled with the direction of Mason to go out and find Madame Versailles. Find an unknown variety actress, only the devil's imps knew where. Such birds had no marked tree to roost in. Besides, this person was probably Madame Gladys by now, or Estelle something or other. I could not go back to Mason for further light, he would stare at me and walk away. My directions were accurate. Find Madame Versailles first, and then go to Richmond. I turned up the collar of my greatcoat, 
and went down for a conference with the omniscient Scully. I found him directing commerce with the gestures of a Roman praetor. I darted past the row of cabs to his island of safety and seized his hand. A moment later, when the tide had passed, he took my bill from between the fingers of his glove and held it under his broad thumb. Then he smiled benignly. "'Mr. Parks,' he said, "'tis the speed limit you are after wishing to exceed.' "'No,' I said. "'I am the king of the Golden Mountain on the quest of a fairy.' "'Go along. You're fooling,' he said. "'By no means,' I answered. "'I want to find Madame Versailles.' He whistled softly. "'Madame Versailles, is it?' "'Tis only the devil that knows where she is now. "'But where she'll be at one to-night "'tis Scully that knows as well as the devil. "'In a Dago cafe on the Bowery, "'which is next door to Paddy Moran's dance-hall, "'she will be eating and drinking and carrying on. "'She's a bad one, this Madame Versailles. "'Tis back to the tall weeds your friend Scully "'would advise you to be going.' At half-past twelve that night I found Madame Versailles and the café called Dago by my friend Scully. It was a fragment of Paris transplanted to the Bowery by Monsieur Popineau, an oily, obsequious little creature from the Montmartre. He came running out to the curb to bow me in. The coming of a hansom was an event. He enumerated his wares with true Latin enthusiasm. His caviar had arrived that very day. It was magnifique, and his wines, ah, monsieur, he alone in all this raw land had wines. His brother Anselm hunted France, nosed it, fingered it, tasted it, that he, Popino, might have champagne, fragrant like those little meadows nestling at the foothills of the Pyrenees. Burgundy, red like the poppies in the wheat fields of the Oise, an absinthe. Here language failed him. He clasped his hands. Ravissant, monsieur. Madame Popineau, who presided over the cash drawer by the door, beamed upon me as I entered. She was a daughter of the little shops along the Seine, fat and vigilant, knowing instantly if the newcomer had the price of a glass of wine in his pocket, a virtue of the highest order to her, doubtless the only one remaining. I selected a little table by the wall, and not wishing to be poisoned, ordered a bottle of bass ale and a plate of dry biscuits, wiping out Popino's disgust with a generous tip. The place was evidently a bohemian rendezvous of a low order. The atmosphere was a stench of tobacco and sour wine. The floor was freshly sprinkled with new sawdust. The chairs and tables were of metal. Iron alone could resist large primitive emotions when they got in action. The crash of an elbow, the heave of a heavy boot-toe, did not wreck a wire chair. It could be straightened presently in the crack of a door. The place was filling up with jetsam from the undercurrents of New York. Gentlemen going swiftly down to the sill of the world, beasts coming up from it got somehow into evening clothes, sat well together under Monsieur Popineau's many-colored lights. It was the depravity of Paris without a touch of its seductive esprit. The naive, mischievous greeting of the Moulin Rouge and the Folie Bergère, Je vous aime, donnez-moi cinq francs, was not here. This place was an oak for crows. I wondered on what limb of it perched Madame Versailles. I was about to summon the good Popineau to my assistance when a young man, very drunk, came in, accompanied by a woman in a superb opera coat. They took the table opposite to mine. The young man wore a soft slouch hat, which he promptly threw on the floor. Then he began to hammer on the table with the ferrule of his walking-stick and shout, <laughs> Popin' oh, you old dog! A bottle of burgundy for Madame Versailles! It's the wine of love and laughter!" My eyes went instantly to the woman. She was a medium-sized, conspicuous blonde, with a rather trim figure, excellent arms and throat, made the most of by a low gown of black velvet. Her complexion was the usual sort to be had from boxes and paint-pots. Her mouth was a perfect Cupid's bow, and exquisite. 
Her nose was bourgeois, but not obtrusive and not bad. Her eyes, however, were utterly bad. They reminded me of cold tallow. Her bright yellow hair was coiled on the top of her head to give an effect of height and to lengthen her face. While her companion was unspeakably drunk, this woman was coldly sober. She constantly refilled the man's glass, but scarcely tasted her own. I was evidently spectator at the epilogue of a quarrel which Madame Versailles was striving to drown in the mixture of alcohol and claret that Popino sold for Burgundy. She spoke almost in whispers, but now and then the man broke out in a voice that I could hear. "'No, I won't wait no more. I want them back. You said you only wanted them to star in. That's what you said, to star in. Madame Versailles patted him on the arm and cooed over him, but her face was as cold as a wedge. The man harped on the one idea. No, I was drunk. Didn't I tell you I was drunk when I did it? And they've got to go back to her. Madame Versailles suddenly changed her tactics. She leaned over seized the young man by the collar and shook him. What she said I could not hear, but the effect on the drunken youth was marked. He pleaded in blabbering slobbers. "'That's all right. You keep them. They're yours. You dissolve them in vinegar and drink them like Cleopatra. You're a good little thing. You're a good little sweet thing.' The man's drooling grew gradually inarticulate. His head wobbled. Presently he made an ineffectual effort to pat Madame Versailles' porcelain cheek, and fell forward with his arms outstretched on the table. Popinot's burgundy was indeed distilled from the poppies of the Oise. The woman ordered a tumbler of whiskey and drank it like water. My hour had arrived. I arose and threaded away to her table. "'Have I the honor,' I said, to address Madame Versailles?' A furtive light came into the cold, tallow eyes. "'Not so loud,' she said. "'Are you a plain-clothes Johnny?' I assured her that I had attained to no such dignity as that. I was merely one coming under a flag of truce with a message from Miss Carolyn Pickney. I said this over several times and in a variety of ways before Madame's suspicions were soothed down. Then I laid before her the offer to pay ten thousand dollars cash for the jewels, a clean-cut trade and no questions, the money in her hands for the jewels in ours. I did not go further into the place or details of payment. That would better follow a little later on. "'I'll stand for that,' said Madame Versailles, "'if it's straight goods. But you will have to show it to Henderson. If he don't flag it, the old hen can have her shiners. I wondered mildly if we might find Henderson somewhere. Sure, said Madame Versailles. Then she summoned Popino. Call up Henderson's detective agency, she directed, and tell Bobby to chase in here. While we waited the chasing in of Bobby, I drew the celebrity out a little on the subject of the slumbering youth. He was an only nephew of Miss Carolyn Pickney and her half-brother, Bishop Simonton of New York. He was an orphan and a very ebon sheep. Having fallen a victim to Madame Versailles' charms, he had shouldered the onerous duties of an angel, burned his money, and finally swiped the jewels from his relative and bestowed them on this Dulcinea. These jewels Madame Versailles thought it advisable to retain, since the law could not take a fall out of her without jugging the youth. She appealed to me to affirm the moral soundness of her attitude in this. A poor girl must look out for herself. I was spared the embarrassment of a decision on so vexed a question by the arrival of Bobby Henderson. I was also glad of all the people in the Café La Lune d'Or when he came bursting in it. He was a person with a variegated waistcoat many seals and yellow diamonds, and a face that would have convicted him before any jury in America without a word of evidence for the state. He sailed down upon me with the bluster of the east wind. Flesh is star, he said, but you loose from the lady. His language was beyond me, 
but his manner admitted of no doubt. Madame Versailles sprang up and thrust her elbow vigorously into the region of his diaphragm. Cut it out, Bobby, she said. You ain't wise to the gent. He's no plain clothes, Johnny. This thing's business. Mr. Robert Henderson was illumined. He drew up a chair and expressed his desolation at the error. Then the three of us got down to the details of Madame Versailles' business. The offer to pay cash was pleasing to Mr. Henderson. It sounded good, but he would take no chances on a double cross being handed out. The money must be paid in his presence at a bank. No meet-me-under-the-oak-tree for him. He was on to the iniquities of the human family. By gradual indirect suggestions, I uncovered the plan to pay at the Jefferson Trust Company in Richmond under his eye. He took to that. It was the old hen's nest, to be sure, but doubtless the only place where she could gather up so large a wad of dough. And thus, after many glasses of vile brandy, which on my part I managed to tip out deftly into the sawdust, we got the business closed. Mr. Robert Henderson nearly crushed my hand at parting. It was so rare a thing, he said, to meet one of his kind of gentlemen nowadays. Madame Versailles beamed, and we parted in genial fashion. I had a word with Popinot at the door, after oiling the itching in his palm with a silver dollar. Poof! he said. Madame Versailles was less French than his café cat. She was born in Harlem under a shamrock. She had heard him, Popinot, name the divine Versailles in a flood of longing for his native country. The name pleased her. She implored him to say it again and yet again, until she got it, and so came Madame Versailles. Mon Dieu! One sad split themselves with laughter. A grisette named for a palace. Monsieur Villon never did so excellent a naming. La demi-monde, l'édifice public, one saw instantly the fitness of it. He, Popinot, was a genius of the first order. And so I left him, shaking in the door and calling upon Olympus to send down his mead of bay leaves. Incomparable Popinot of the golden moon. Shortly before ten o'clock on the tenth day of February, I walked from my hotel over to the Jefferson Trust Company in the city of Richmond. I was taken at once into the vault of the safety deposit boxes, where I found Miss Carolyn Pickney and the vault officer, Mr. Montague Thomas. This young man greeted me courteously, but I had only another stately nod from Miss Pickney. She would never come to understand the social order of a commercial civilization. One who took directions from another, no matter in how exalted a sphere that other sat, was a variety of servant. It was the theory of the slave-master bred in deep, and persisting after the decadence of the civilization that produced it. Promptly at ten, Mr. Robert Henderson arrived. He wore a large checked ulster, a top hat, and astonishingly yellow gloves. He greeted me as a lost neighbor discovered in a distant country, shook vigorously the rather limp hand of Mr. Montague Thomas, but went back on his heels before Miss Carolyn Pickney. She did not see him. She never saw him. I appreciated the need to get the matter speedily over, and requested Mr. Henderson to allow Miss Pickney to examine the jewels. He threw open his ulster, revealing a small leather handbag, secured to his waist by a chain, such as is used by bank messengers. He opened the bag and took out an ancient black leather case, which he also opened and held in his hand. In it, lying coiled up against the lining of old purple velvet, was a pyramid pin, two drop earrings, and a strand of oriental pearls. Miss Pickney expressed satisfaction to Mr. Montague Thomas and directed him to open the safety deposit box. The young man fitted the key into the lock of box number 320 and drew down the door, showing the little steel vault packed with banknotes. He took out the money in packages, each enclosed by a printed slip, such as are commonly used by banks, and marked two thousand dollars. 
Mr. Robert Henderson handed me one end of the jewel case to hold, and with his free hand he stowed these five packs of bills into the little handbag. When he had the last one safely in, he relaxed his grip on the jewel case, locked his handbag, and hurried out of the bank. I handed the case to Miss Carolyn Pickney. She opened it and caressed the jewels lovingly. But she said no word, and gave no evidence of the great emotion tugging at her, except the trembling of her hands. Then she put the case in her bosom, and went down to her carriage in the company of Mr. Montague Thomas. I went out behind the pair of them. Not in all my life had I been so thoroughly puzzled. What did this woman need with Randolph Mason if she intended to pay a painted actress the full value of the jewels? Any police sergeant could have done as well as he. What need was there to send me scouting into the tenderloin, and then here? The thing was idiotic. I had been waiting to see the iron lid of some hidden trap fall swiftly and crush Madame Versailles. Instead, I had carried out Mason's directions to the final letter, only to see the money paid, the incident closed, the thing ended. For Randolph Mason it was not a defeat only, it was a capitulation, a rout. His standard had been dragged off the field by a variety actress and a red-light detective. I was unspeakably bitter and depressed. My train to New York left over the Southern at twelve o'clock. I would go to the post office for some letters sent after me, get a little lunch, and hurry out of this unfortunate city. This capital of a phantom empire was historic of disaster. Reputations were always laid by the heels here. I went into the post office, got my letters, and was coming out when a deputy marshal touched me on the elbow and asked me to come up to the district attorney's office. I knew then that Mason's trap had sprung, and I hurried with the little man up the iron stairway. Mr. Robert Henderson was boiling in picturesque expletives when I entered the anteroom of the prosecutor for the government. His collar was wilted down, his wonderful waistcoat crumpled, tiny threads of perspiration lay along the fat folds of his chin. He broke out louder when he saw me. That's him! "'That's one of the gang,' he shouted. "'Now get the other one. "'Get this Caroline Pitney woman, "'and we'll land her in a penitentiary.' At this moment a tall, gracious man, with a soft, drawling accent that purred dangerously like a cat's, appeared in the doorway of the district attorney's office. "'May I inquire,' he said, "'who it is that is about to send Miss Caroline Pitney to the penitentiary?' "'It's me,' said Henderson. "'Her and this Jaeger have been shoving a queer.' "'Your language is unintelligible,' said the man. "'Why, green goods,' growled Henderson. "'Passing counterfeit money, that's what I mean.' It was my turn to be astonished. So, the packs were counterfeit. Surely Mason could not have made so dangerous a blunder. He knew the laws of the United States. He could not have opened the doors of the penitentiary wider to us. The mere possession of counterfeit money was a crime. Perhaps he did not believe that Madame Versailles would dare to come to the officers of the law with it. Perhaps some other arm of his plan had broken down. I was amazed and alarmed. The man in the door looked inquiringly at me. I took out my card and handed it to him. He bowed. I am the district attorney, he said. Then he spoke to the deputy marshal. Go outside, close the door, and see that I am not interrupted. He turned then to the detective. Now, my man, he continued, what is all this furor about? Henderson gave the matter swiftly in detail, translating his tenderloin terms as he proceeded. When he had concluded the narrative, the district attorney asked to see the money. Henderson unlocked his satchel, took out a pack, stripped off the gum band at either end of it, and holding the end of the pack in his fingers, shook out the bills before the district attorney. The lawyer had been listening with the closest attention, his face clouded and distressed. Now it cleared like a summer morning. 
Are the others like this? he said. The same, replied Henderson. A good tenor on the top and bottom, and the rest queer. Then, said the district attorney, the laws of the United States have not been violated. These bills are not counterfeit. Mr. Henderson mopped his wet face. What? he ejaculated. It ain't good money, is it? No, replied the lawyer. It is not money at all. Astonishment drove Mr. Henderson to his primal tongue. "'Hell, man,' he said. "'Tain't good, tain't bad. You're stringing me.' The district attorney was amused. He took the pack of money and spread it out on the table. "'These,' he said, "'are bills of the Confederate States of America. They are in no sense counterfeit.' The passing of these bills for money of the United States is no crime against its laws. The federal courts have time and again so decided. Although these bills closely resemble certain banknote issues of the federal government, and have been more than once complained of by the Treasury Department. Then he added, with a courtly bow to Henderson, My dear sir, you have in your hands the promise of a vanished republic to pay you some ten thousand dollars once upon a time these bills might have purchased you an excellent lunch and perhaps a cigar with it i doubt it a little now you might try mosby taylor on the corner below mentioned jubal early then he turned to me mr parks he said as you have not these potent tokens of a great sentiment to assist you, I must beg the honor of your presence at luncheon with me. I have heard of Randolph Mason. For the legal principle involved in this story, see United States v. Barrett, 111 Fed, 369. End of Madame Versailles by Melville Davison Post Recording by Rick Rodstrom Mrs. Dennison's Head From Cobwebs from an Empty Skull By Dodd Grill This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Mrs. Dennison's Head by Dodd Grill While I was employed in the bank of loan and discount, said Mr. Applegarth, smiling the smile with which he always prefaced a nice old story, there was another clerk there named Dennison, a quiet, reticent fellow, the very soul of truth and a great favorite with us all. He always wore crepe in his hat, and once, when asked for whom he was in mourning, he replied his wife, and seemed very affected. We all expressed our sympathy as delicately as possible, and no more was said upon the subject. Some weeks after this he seemed to have arrived at that stage of tempered grief at which it becomes a relief to give sorrow words, to speak of the departed one to sympathizing friends. For one day he voluntarily began talking of his bereavement, and of the terrible calamity by which his wife had been deprived of her head. This sharpened our curiosity to the keenest edge, but of course we controlled it, hoping he would volunteer some further information with regard to so singular a misfortune. But when day after day went by, and he did not allude to the matter, we got worked up into a fever of excitement about it. One evening after Dennison had gone, we held a kind of political meeting about it, at which all possible and impossible methods of decapitation were suggested as the ones to which Mrs. D. probably owed her extraordinary demise. I am sorry to add, that we so far forgot the grave character of the event 
as to lay small wagers that it was done this way or that way, that it was accidental or premeditated, that she had a hand in it herself, or that it was wrought by circumstances beyond her control. All was mere conjecture, however, but from that time Denison, as the custodian of a secret upon which we had staked our cash, was an object of more than usual interest. It wasn't entirely that, either. Aside from our paltry wagers, we felt a consuming curiosity to know the truth for its own sake. Each set himself to work to elicit the dread secret in some way, and the misdirected ingenuity we developed was wonderful. All sorts of pious devices were resorted to to entice poor Denison into clearing up the mystery. By a thousand indirect methods we sought to entrap him into divulging all. History, fiction, poesy, all were laid under contribution, and from Goliath down through Charles I to Sam Speaker, a local celebrity, who got his head entangled in milling machinery, every one who had ever mourned the loss of a head received his due share of attention during office hours. The regularity with which we introduced, and the pernicity with which we stuck to this one topic, came near to getting us all discharged. For one day the cashier came out of his private office, and intimated that if we valued our situations, the subject of hanging would afford us the means of retaining them. He added that he always selected his subordinates with an eye to their conversational abilities, but variety of subject was as desirable, at times, as exhaustive treatment. During all this discussion, Dennison, albeit he had evinced from the first a singular interest in the theme, and shirked not his fair share of the conversation, never once seemed to understand that it had any reference to himself. His frank, truthful nature was quite unable to detect the personal significance of the subject. It was plain that nothing short of a definite inquiry would elicit the information we were dying to obtain. And at a caucus one evening, we drew lots to determine who should openly propound it. The choice fell on me. The next morning, we were at the bank somewhat earlier than usual waiting impatiently for Denison, and the time to open the doors. They always arrived together. When Denison stepped into the room, bowing in his engaging manner to each clerk as he passed to his own desk, I confronted him, shaking him warmly by the hand. At that moment all the others fell to writing and figuring with unusual avidity, as if thinking of anything under the sun except Denison's wife's head. Oh, Denison, I began, as carelessly as I could manage it. Speaking of decapitation reminds me of something that I would like to ask you. I have intended to ask it several times, but it has always slipped my memory. Of course you will pardon me if it's not a fair question. As if by magic the scratching of pens died away, leaving a dead silence, which quite disconcerted me, but I blundered on. I heard the other day, that is, you said, or it was in the newspapers, or somewhere, something about your poor wife, you understand? About her losing her head. Would you mind telling me how such a distressing accident, if it were an accident, occurred? When I finished, Denison walked straight past me as if he didn't see me, went round the counter to his stool, and perched himself gravely on the top of it, facing the other clerks. Then he began speaking calmly, and without apparent emotion. Gentlemen, I have long desired to speak of this thing, but you gave me no encouragement, and I naturally supposed you were indifferent. I now thank you for all the friendly interest you take in my affairs. I will satisfy your curiosity on this point at once, if you will promise never hereafter to allude to the matter, and to ask not a single question now. We all promised on our sacred honor, 
and collected about him with the utmost eagerness. He bent his head a moment, then raised it, and quietly said, My poor wife's head was bitten off. By what? we all exclaimed eagerly, with suspended breath. He gave us a look full of reproach, turned to his desk, and went at his work. We went to ours. The End of Mrs. Dennison's Head by Dodd Grill Plato, The Story of a Cat by A. S. Downs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Plato, The Story of a Cat by A. S. Downs One day last summer, a large, handsome black cat walked gravely up one side of Main Street, crossed, and went halfway down the other. He stopped at a house called The Den, went up the piazza steps, and paused by an open window. The lady sitting inside saw and spoke to him, but without taking any notice, he put his paws on the sill, looked around the rooms as if wondering if it would suit him, and finally gazed into her face. After thinking a minute, he went in, and from that hour took his place as an important member of the family. Civil to all, he gives his love only to the lady whom he first saw and it is odd to see, as he lies by the fire, how he listens to all the conversation, but raises his head only when she speaks, and drops it again when she has finished, with a pleased air. No other person in the house is so wise, for he alone never makes a mistake. The hours he selects for his exercise are the sunniest, the carpet he lies upon the softest, and he knows the moment he enters the room whether his friend will let him lie in her lap, or whether, because of her best gown, she will have none of him. No one at the den can tell how he came to be called Plato. It is a fact that he answers to the name, and when asked if so known before he came there, smiles wisely. What matters it? the smile says how I was called, or where I came from, since I am Plato, and am here. He dislikes noise, and entirely disapproves sweeping. A broom and a dustpan fill him with anxiety, and he seeks the soft cushions of the big lounge. But when these in their turn are beaten and tossed about, he retreats to the study table. However, as soon as he learned that once a week his favorite room was turned into chaos, he sought another refuge, and refuses to get up that day until noon. Many were the speculations as to Plato's Christmas present. All were satisfied with a rattan basket, just large enough for him to lie in, and a light open canopy, cushions of cardinal chintz, and a cardinal satin bow to which was fastened a lovely card. It was set before Plato, and although it is probable that it was the first he had ever seen, he showed neither surprise nor curiosity, but looked at it loftily, as if such a retreat should have been given him long ago. For could not any discerning person see he was accustomed to luxury? He stepped in carefully and curled himself gracefully upon the soft cushions the glowing tints of which were very becoming to his sable beauty. It was soon seen that Plato was very fond of his basket, and was unwilling to share it in the smallest degree. When little Betsy put her doll in, just to see if the cardinal was becoming to her, he looked so stern, and walked so fiercely toward them, that the doll's heart sank within her, and Betsy said, Please excuse us, Plato. If balls and toys were carelessly dropped there, he would push them out without delay. And if visitors 
took up the basket to examine it, he would fix his eyes upon them, thinking, Oh, yes, you would pick pockets or steal the spoons if I did not watch you. As his conduct can never be predicted, great was the curiosity when one cold afternoon he was noticed walking up the avenue while a miserable yellow kitten dragged herself after him. She was so thin you could count her bones, and she had been so pulled and kicked that there seemed to be nothing of her but length and dirt. When Lord Plato chooses, he enters the front doors, but as he waits no man's pleasure, unless it pleases him first, he has a way of getting in on his own account. Upon one of the shed doors is an old-fashioned latch, which by jumping he can reach and lift with his paw. Having opened the door, he pushed his poor yellow straggler in, and followed himself. She lay down at once upon the floor, and Plato began washing her with his rough tongue, while the lookers-on assisted his hospitality by bringing a saucer of milk. While she ate, Plato rested, looking as pleased as if he were her mother at her enjoyment. The luncheon finished, the washing was resumed, and as the waif was now able to help, she soon looked more respectable. But Plato had not finished his work of mercy. He looked at the door leading to the parlor, then at her, and finally bent down tenderly to her little torn ears, as if whispering. But she would not move. Perhaps in all her wretched life she had never been so comfortable, and believed in letting well enough alone. Reason and persuasion alike useless, Plato concluded to try force and, taking her by the back of the neck, carried her through the house and dropped her close to his dainty, cherished basket. Then he appeared a little uncertain what to do. The basket was nice and warm. He was tired and cold. It had been a present to him. The street wanderer was dirty still, and the rug would be a softer bed than she had ever known. Were these his thoughts? And was it selfishness he conquered, when at last he lifted the shivering, homeless creature into his own beautiful nest? The End of Plato The Story of a Cat By A. S. Downs The Sending of Dana Da by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sending of Dana Da. When the devil rides on your chest, remember the chamar. Native proverb. Once upon a time some people in India made a new heaven and a new earth out of broken teacups, a missing brooch or two, and a hairbrush. These were hidden under bushes, or stuffed into holes in the hillside, and an entire civil service of subordinate gods used to find or mend them again. And everyone said, There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy. Several other things happened also but the religion never seemed to get much beyond its first manifestations though it added an airline postal duck and orchestral effects in order to keep abreast of the times and stall off competition the religion was too elastic for ordinary use it stretched itself and embraced pieces of everything that medicine men of all ages have manufactured it approved and stole from freemasonry looted the latter-day rosicrucians of half their pet words took any fragments of egyptian philosophy that it found in the encyclopaedia britannica annexed as many of the vedas as had been translated into french or english and talked of all the rest built in the german versions of what is left of the zend avesta encouraged white grey and black magic including spiritualism palmistry fortune telling by cards hot chestnuts double kerneled nuts and tallow droppings would have adopted voodoo and oboe had it known anything about them 
and showed itself in every way one of the most accommodating arrangements that had ever been invented since the birth of the sea when it was in thorough working order with all the machinery down to the subscriptions complete Dunada came from nowhere with nothing in his hands and wrote a chapter in its history which has hitherto been unpublished he said that his first name was dana and his second was da now setting aside dana of the new york sun dana is a bill name and da fits no native of india unless you accept the bengali day as the original spelling da is lap or finish and dana da was neither fin chin bill bengali lap nair gond romany mag bokhariot kurd armenian levantine jew persian punjabi madrasi parsi nor anything else known to ethnologists he was simply danadar and declined to give further information for the sake of brevity and as roughly indicating his origin he was called the native he might have been the original old man of the mountains who is said to be the only authorized head of the teacup creed some people said that he was but danada used to smile and deny any connection with the cult explaining that he was an independent experimenter as i have said he came from nowhere with his hands behind his back and studied the creed for three weeks sitting at the feet of those best competent to explain its mysteries then he laughed aloud and went away but the laugh might have been either of devotion or derision when he returned he was without money but his pride was unabated he declared that he knew more about the things in heaven and earth than those who taught him and for this contumacy he was abandoned altogether his next appearance in public life was at a big cantonment in upper india and he was then telling fortunes with the help of three leaden dice a very dirty old cloth and a little tin box of opium pills he told better fortunes when he was allowed half a bottle of whisky but the things which he invented on the opium were quite worth the money he was in reduced circumstances among other peoples he told the fortune of the englishman who had once been interested in the similar creed but who later on had married and forgotten all his old knowledge in the study of babies and exchange the englishman allowed danada to tell a fortune for charity's sake and gave him five rupees a dinner and some old clothes when he had eaten danada professed gratitude and asked if there were anything he could do for his host in the esoteric line is there any one that you love said danada the englishman loved his wife but had no desire to drag her name into the conversation he therefore shook his head is there any one that you hate said danada the englishman said that there were several men whom he hated deeply very good said danada upon whom the whisky and the opium were beginning to tell only give me their names and i will dispatch a sending to them and kill them now ascending is a horrible arrangement first invented they say in iceland it is a thing sent by a wizard and may take any form but most generally wanders about the land in the shape of a little purple cloud till it finds the sendee and him it kills by changing into the form of a horse or a cat or a man without a face it is not strictly a native patent though chamas can if irritated dispatch ascending which sits on the breast of their enemy by night and nearly kills him very few natives care to irritate chamas for this reason let me dispatch ascending said danada i am nearly dead now with want and drink and opium but i should like to kill a man before i die i can send ascending anywhere you choose and in any form except in the shape of a man the Englishman had no friends that he wished to kill, but partly to soothe Danada, whose eyes were rolling, and partly to see what would be done. He asked whether a modified sending could not be arranged for, such a sending as should make a man's life a burden to him, and yet do him no harm. If this were possible, he notified his willingness to give Danada ten rupees for the job. 
i am not what i was once said danadar and i must take the money because i am poor to what englishman shall i send it send a sending to loan sahib said the englishman naming a man who had been most bitter in rebuking him for his apostasy from the teacup creed danadar laughed and nodded i could have chosen no better man myself said he i will see that he finds the sending about his path and about his bed he lay down on the hearth-rug turned up the whites of his eyes shivered all over and began to snort this was magic or opium or the sending or all three when he opened his eyes he vowed that the sending had started upon the war-path and was at that moment flying up to the town where the lone sahib lives give me my ten rupees said danadar wearily and write a letter to lone sahib telling him and all who believe with him that you and a friend are using a power greater than theirs they will see that you are speaking the truth he departed unsteadily with a promise of some more rupees if anything came of the sending the englishman sent a letter to lone sahib couched in what he remembered of the terminology of the creed he wrote i also in the days of what you held to be my backsliding have obtained enlightenment and with enlightenment has come power then he grew so deeply mysterious that the recipient of the letter could make neither head nor tail of it and was proportionately impressed for he fancied that his friend had become a fifth rounder when a man is a fifth rounder he can do more than slade and houdin combined lone sahib read the letter in five different fashions and was beginning a sixth interpretation when his bearer dashed in with the news that there was a cat on the bed now if there was one thing that lone sahib hated more than another it was a cat he rated the bearer for not turning it out of the house the bearer said that he was afraid all the doors of the bedroom had been shut throughout the morning and no real cat could possibly have entered the room he would prefer not to meddle with the creature lone sahib entered the room gingerly and there on the pillow of his bed sprawled and whimpered a wee white kitten not a jumpsome frisky little beast but a slug-like crawler with its eyes barely opened and its paws lacking strength or direction a kitten that ought to have been in a basket with its mamma lone sahib caught it by the scruff of its neck handed it over to the sweeper to be drowned and find the bearer for annas that evening as he was reading in his room he fancied that he saw something moving about on the hearth-rug outside the circle of light from his reading lamp when the thing began to meow he realized that it was a kitten a wee white kitten nearly blind and very miserable he was seriously angry and spoke bitterly to the bearer who said that there was no kitten in the room when he brought in the lamp and real kittens of tender age generally have mother cats in attendance if the presence will go out into the veranda and listen said the bearer he will hear no cats how therefore can the kitten on the bed and the kitten on the hearthrug be real kittens lone sahib went out to listen and the bearer followed him but there was no sound of rachel mewing for her children he returned to his room having hurled the kitten down the hillside and wrote out the incidents of the day for the benefit of his co-religionists those people were so absolutely free from superstition that they ascribed anything a little out of the common to agencies as it was their business to know all about the agencies they were on terms of almost indecent familiarity with manifestations of every kind their letters dropped from the ceiling unstamped and spirits used to squatter up and down their staircases all night but they had never come into contact with kittens lone sahib wrote out the facts noting the hour and the minute as every physical observer is bound to do but appending the englishman's letter because it was the most mysterious document and might have had a bearing upon anything in this world or the next an outsider would have translated all the tangle thus look out you laughed at me once and now i am going to make you sit up lone sahib's co-religionists found that meaning in it 
but their translation was refined and full of four-syllable words. They held a sederant, and were filled with tremulous joy, for, in spite of their familiarity with all the other worlds and cycles, they had a very human awe of things sent from ghost-land. They met in Lone Sahib's room in shrouded and sepulchral gloom, and their conclave was broken up by a clinking among the photo-frames on the mantelpiece. A wee white kitten, nearly blind, was looping and writhing itself between the clock and the candlesticks. That stopped all investigations or doubtings. Here was the manifestation in the flesh. It was, so far as could be seen, devoid of purpose, but it was a manifestation of undoubted authenticity. They drafted a round robin to the Englishman, the backslider of old days, adjuring him in the interests of the creed to explain whether there was any connection between the embodiment of some Egyptian god or other, I have forgotten the name, and his communication. They called it the Kitten Ra, or Toth, or Shem, or Noah, or something, and when Lone Saib confessed that the first one had, at his most misguided instance, been drowned by the sweeper, they said consolingly that in his next life he would be a bounder, and not even a rounder of the lowest grade. These words may not be quite correct, but they expressed the sense of the house accurately. When the Englishman received the round robin, it came by post, he was startled and bewildered. He sent into the bazaar for Dan Adar, who read the letter and laughed. "'That is my sending,' said he. "'I told you I would work well. "'Now, give me another ten rupees.' "'But what in the world is this gibberish about Egyptian gods?' asked the Englishman. "'Cats!' said Dan Adar, with a hiccup, for he had discovered the Englishman's whisky-bottle. "'Cats! and cats! and cats! Never was such a sending! A hundred of cats! Now give me ten more rupees, and write as I dictate!' Danadar's letter was a curiosity. It bore the Englishman's signature and hinted at a sending of cats. The mere words on paper were creepy and uncanny to behold. "'What have you done, though?' said the Englishman. "'I am as much in the dark as ever. Do you mean to say that you can actually send this absurd sending you talked about?' "'Judge for yourself,' said Danadar. "'What does that letter mean? In a little time?' They will all be at my feet and yours, and I, oh, glory, will be drugged or drunk all day long. Danadar knew his people. When a man who hates cats wakes up in the morning and finds a little squirming kitten on his breast, or puts his hand into his ulster pocket and finds a little half-dead kitten where his gloves should be, or opens his trunk and finds a vile kitten among his dress shirts, or goes for a long ride with his mackintosh strapped on his saddle-bow, and shakes a little sprawling kitten from its folds when he opens it, or goes out to dinner and finds a little blind kitten under his chair, or stays at home and finds a writhing kitten under the quilt, or wriggling among his books, or hanging head downward in his tobacco jar, or being mangled by his terrier in the veranda. When such a man finds one kitten, neither more nor less once a day, in a place where no kitten rightly could or should be, he is naturally upset. When he dare not murder his daily trove because he believes it to be a manifestation, an emissary, an embodiment, and half a dozen other things all out of the regular course of nature, he is more than upset. He is actually distressed. Some of Lone Saib's co-religionists thought that he was a highly favoured individual, but many said that if he had treated the first kitten with proper respect, as suited a Tothra Tum Sennacherib embodiment, all his trouble would have been averted. They compared him to the ancient mariner, but none the less they were proud of him and proud of the Englishman who had sent the manifestation. They did not call it ascending, because Icelandic magic was not in their programme. After sixteen kittens, that is to say, after one fortnight, for there were three kittens on the first day to impress the fact of the sending, the whole camp was uplifted by a letter. It came flying through a window, from the old man of the mountains, the head of all the creed, explaining the manifestation in the most beautiful language, 
and soaking up all the credit of it for himself the englishman said the letter was not there at all he was a backslider without power or asceticism who couldn't even raise a table by force of volition much less project an army of kittens through space the entire arrangement said the letter was strictly orthodox worked and sanctioned by the highest authorities within the pale of the creed there was great joy at this for some of the weaker brethren seeing that an outsider who had been working on independent lines could create kittens whereas their own rulers had never gone beyond crockery and broken at that were showing a desire to break line on their own trail in fact there was the promise of a schism a second round robin was drafted to the englishman beginning oh scoffer and ending with a selection of curses from the rites of Mizraim and memphis and the combination of ugana who was a fifth rounder upon whose name an upstart third rounder once traded a papal excommunication is a billet doux compared to the combination of ugana the englishman had been proved under the hand and seal of the old man of the mountains to have appropriated virtue and pretended to have power which in reality belonged only to the supreme head naturally the round robin did not spare him he handed the letter to danadar to translate into decent english the effect on danadar was curious at first he was furiously angry and then he laughed for five minutes i had a thought he said that they would have come to me in another week i would have shown that i sent the sending and they would have disowned the old man of the mountains who has sent this sending of mine do you do nothing the time has come for me to act write as i dictate and i will put them to shame but give me ten more rupees at danadar's dictation the englishman wrote nothing less than a formal challenge to the old man of the mountains it wound up and if this manifestation be from your hand then let it go forward but if it be from my hand i will that the sending shall cease in two days time on that day there shall be twelve kittens and thenceforward none at all the people shall judge between us this was signed by danadar who added pentacles and pentagrams and a crook sansata and half a dozen swastikas and a triple tau to his name just to show that he was all he laid claim to be the challenge was read out to the gentlemen and ladies and they remembered then that danadar had laughed at them some years ago it was officially announced that the old man of the mountains would treat the matter with contempt danadar being an independent investigator without a single round at the back of him but this did not soothe his people they wanted to see a fight they were very human for all their spirituality lone sahib who was really being worn out with kittens submitted meekly to his fate he felt that he was being kittened to prove the power of danadar as the poet says when the stated day dawned the shower of kittens began some were white and some were tabby and all were about the same loathsome age three were on his hearthrug three in his bathroom and the other six turned up at intervals among the visitors who came to see the prophecy break down never was a more satisfactory sending on the next day there were no kittens and the next day and all the other days were kittenless and quiet the people murmured and looked to the old man of the mountains for an explanation a letter written on a palm leaf dropped from the ceiling but everyone except lone sahib felt that letters were not what the occasion demanded there should have been cats there should have been cats full-grown ones the letter proved conclusively that there had been a hitch in the psychic current which colliding with a dual identity had interfered with the percipient activity all along the main line the kittens were still going on but owing to some failure in the developing fluid they were not materialized the air was thick with letters for a few days afterwards unseen hands played gluck and beethoven on finger bowls and clock shades but all men felt that psychic life was a mockery without materialized kittens even lone sahib shouted with the majority on this head danadar's letters were very insulting and if he had then offered to lead a new departure 
there is no knowing what might not have happened but dana da was dying of whisky and opium in the englishman's godown and had small heart for new creeds they have been put to shame said he never was such a sending it has killed me nonsense said the englishman you are going to die dana da and that sort of stuff must be left behind i'll admit that you have made some queer things come about tell me honestly now how is it done give me ten more rupees said dana da faintly and if i die before i spend them bury them with me the silver was counted out while dana da was fighting with death his hand closed upon the money and he smiled a grim smile bend low he whispered the englishman bent bunia mission school expelled boxwalla peddler ceylon pearl merchant all mine english education outcasted and made up name dana da england with american thought reading man and and you gave me ten rupees several time i gave the sahib's bearer two eight a month for cats little little cats i wrote and he put them about very clever man very few kittens now in the bazaar ask lone sahib sweeper's wife so saying danadar gasped and passed away into a land where if all be true there are no materializations and the making of new creeds is discouraged but consider the gorgeous simplicity of it all end of the sending of danadar by rudyard kipling the sphinx at giza from fifty one tales by lord dunsinay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dale growthman the sphinx at giza by lord dunsinay i saw the other day the sphinx's painted face she had painted her face in order to ogle time and he has spared no other painted face in all the world but hers delilah was younger than she and delilah is dust time hath loved nothing but this worthless painted face i do not care that she is ugly nor that she has painted her face so that she only lure his secret from time time dallies like a fool at her feet when he should be smiting cities time never wearies of her silly smile there are temples all about her that he has forgotten to spoil i saw an old man go by and time never touched him time that has carried away the seven gates of thebes she has tried to bind him with the ropes of eternal sand she had hoped to oppress him with the pyramids he lies there in the sand with his foolish hair all spread about her paws if she ever finds his secret we will put out his eyes so that he shall find no more of our beautiful things there are lovely gates in florence that i fear he will carry away we have tried to bind him with song and with old customs but they only held him for a little while and he has always smitten us and mocked us when he is blind he shall dance for us and make sport great clumsy time shall stumble and dance who like to kill little children and can hurt even the daisies no longer then shall our children laugh at him who slew babylon's winged bulls and smote great numbers of the gods and fairies when he is shorn of his hours and his years we will shut him up in the pyramid of cheops in the great chamber where the sarcophagus is thence we will lead him out when we give our feasts 
he shall ripen our corn for us and do menial work we will we will kiss thy painted face o sphinx if thou wilt betray to us time and yet i fear in his ultimate anguish he may take hold blindly of the world and the moon and slowly pull down upon him the house of man end of the sphinx at giza by lord dunsinay the stone by henry goodman from the best short stories of 1919 edited by edwin j o'brien this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman the stone by henry goodman Martha Sloan's goin' the way of Jim, said Deems Lennon to his wife. See? And he pointed through the open window toward the cemetery. I seen her before Jim Stone, beggin' on her knees and mumblin' with her hands stretched out. She's been that way a number of times when I've come upon her as I was fixin' up the graves. Mrs. Lennon, a stout, pleasant-faced woman, looked in the direction indicated by her husband. Together they watched Martha Sloan, white-haired, thin, and bent, making her way up the cemetery path. She was nervous, and her walk was broken by little, sudden pauses, in which she looked about. "'Poor soul,' said Mrs. Lennon. "'She's afraid. She ain't been herself since Dorothy died. Losing the two children right after Jim has broke her up completely.' She's afraid for herself, said her husband. If you heard her up there by the stone, you'd have thought she was speaking to someone alive, to someone who could do her things. Oh, well, it's enough to make anyone queer, Mrs. Lennon said. Then she stopped and watched the figure on the hillside. Look, said Mrs. Lennon. Look at her. She's down on her knees. Deems stood by her near the window. "'That's it,' he exclaimed. "'That's exactly what she's been doing now for some time. "'I heard her speak. "'I don't know where she got the idea. "'She thinks Jim's following her, "'reaching out for her, trying to grasp her. "'I heard her plead. "'I don't know what'll come of it.' "'They were both startled when, as suddenly as Martha Sloane had knelt, she rose from her place before the gravestone and, moving in nervous haste, ran down the path. Deems, we must go to her, said Mrs. Lennon. Maybe we could do something for her. And as they both hurried into the kitchen and out of the house, Martha Sloane, panting and white-faced from fright, rushed to the house. Deems, she gasped. Deems, it's Jim. He's reaching out. He's reaching out to seize me. Martha, calm yourself, said Deems, taking Martha Sloan's shaking hand in his. That ain't right. You're sensible. You mustn't think so much of it. You must keep your mind away. That's right, Martha, Mrs. Lennon said, as she helped Martha Sloan into the house. You mustn't keep thinking of Jim and keep going up there all the time. There's many things waiting for you at home, and when you're through there, why don't you come over to us? But Martha Sloane, either not hearing or not heeding the words of Deems and his wife, sat huddled, nervously whispering, more to herself than to her friends. It's Jim! It's his hand reaching out for me! He took Dorothy! He took Joseph! and he's reaching out now to me. He can't stand having me living. She was nervous, and in the power of a fear that was stronger than her will. She sat uneasily looking about her, as if knowing she was safe in the house of friends, but as if feeling herself momentarily in the presence of something strange and frightful. She cast frightened looks about her at the room, at Mrs. Lemon, and at Deems. 
She looked at them in silence, as if she did not know how to speak to them, until, prompted by a great uneasiness, she spoke in a loud whisper. Take me home, Deems. I want to get away. Deems slipped into his coat and said to his wife, I'll be back soon. Then, helping Martha from the chair, walked out with her. Come now, Martha. You know us well enough. We're your friends, aren't we? And we tell you there's nothing to fear. It's all your believing. There's nothing after you. There's nothing you need to fear. You don't know. It was he took my two children. He took Dorothy. When they laid her out in the parlor, I could see him standing at her head. He was cruel when he lived. He beat them, Dorothy and Joseph. They hated him. And when they laid out Joseph after his fall, when the bridge gave way, Jim was standing by his head, and his eyes were laughing at me like he'd say, I took him, but now there's you, and he's trying for me now. Deems was pleased that she was speaking. He hoped that in conversing she would find respite from her thoughts. No, Martha, he said, that wasn't Jim that took Dorothy and Joseph. You know there's a God that gives and takes. Their years were run. Can't you see, Martha? It was Jim who took. He couldn't see them living. When he'd lived, he couldn't see them growing up to be themselves. He took them like he took me from you. Do you remember Deems how he came, and in no time I was his? He owned me completely. Deems was silent. There was no arguing. Even now there was vividly alive in his mind, and, he knew, in the minds of the other villagers, the recollection of that sense of possession which went with Jim Sloan. He recalled that William Carroll had hanged himself when he could not pay Jim Sloan the debt he owed him. It was true that Jim Sloan had owned his children as if they were pieces of property. The whole village had learned to know this fact soon after these children had grown up. Deems, recalling his feelings for Martha Sloan, remember how the amazement, the astonishment, with which he had viewed the change that came over Martha immediately after her marriage to Jim Sloan. She had been light-hearted and joyful, as if overflowing with the vitality natural to the country around the village. There had been gladness in her laugh. Immediately after her marriage, all this had changed. Martha had been wont to run lightly about her father's house. Her movements had become suddenly freighted with a seriousness that was not natural to her. Her laughter quieted to a restrained smile, which in turn gave way to uniform seriousness. The whole village noted and remarked the change. He's older than she, they'd say, and is making her see things as he does. When they reached the house, Martha, without a word, left Deems and hurried in. Deems turned away, looking back and shaking his head, and while he mumbled to himself, There's no good in this. There's no good for Martha. He was struck motionless when suddenly he beheld Martha by the window. He had thought her slightly composed when she had left him, for her manner was more quiet than it had been. Now he was startled. Out of the window she leaned, her eyes fastened on a distant gravestone, white, large, and dominating, a shaft that rose upright like a gigantic spear on the crest of the hill. He watched her face and head, and saw that her movements were frightened. As she moved her head, it seemed she was following something with her eyes, which, look as closely as he could, he failed to make out. There was a jerkiness of movement that showed her alert and startled. From the musky dark parlor, Martha looked out on the cemetery. There, clear in the evening light, stood a large white stone, a terrible symbol that held her. To her nervous mind, alive with the creations of her fear, it seemed she could read the lines. James Sloan, born September 14th, 1857, died November 12th, 1915, and below it, stamped clearly and illuminated by her fright, his faithful wife, 
Martha Sloan, born August 9, 1871, died, dash, dash. At the thought of the word died, followed by the dash, she recoiled. The dash reaching out to her, reaching to her, swept into her mind all the graspingness of James, which had squeezed the sweetness out of life, all the hardness which had marked his possession of it. Was it her mind, prodded by terror, that visualized it? There seemed to advance from the hill, from the cemetery, from the very gravestone which was beginning to blot and blur in her vision. She saw a hand, his hand. It was coming, coming to her, to crush what life was left in her. Even in her own mind it was a miracle that she had survived Jim's tenacity. When Jim had died, she began suddenly to recover her former manner of life. She began to win back to herself. It was as if the siege of winter, having lifted, the breath and warmth of spring might now again prevail. Then had come the horrors of uncontrollable dreams, followed by the death by fire of Dorothy. That had shaken her completely. She recalled their rescuing Dorothy, how they had dragged her out of the fire, her clothes all burnt off. They had sought to nurse her back to health, and, in the week before her daughter died, she had learned something of what happened the night of the fire. In her sleep, Dorothy had heard herself call, and she thought it was her father's voice. She had arisen when she seemed to see beside her her father, as he had looked in life. She had followed him to the barn, and suddenly he had told her that he had come back to take her with him, as he had promised to before his death. In her struggle to escape him, she had flung the lantern. In the parlor they had laid out Dorothy, a blackened, burnt frame. All her care and love and solitude she concentrated on Joseph. She thought that perhaps by an intenser, all-embracing love for Joseph, she would be enabled to defeat the spell that she felt hanging over her life. Then when it seemed that life would begin anew to take on a definite meaning. Joseph, grown up, was given purpose to it. She remembered that someone had knocked timidly on the door and had announced in a frightening voice, Mrs. Sloan, there's been a terrible accident. The bridge fell. She remembered that she had screamed, My Joseph, my boy, and then had found herself in the parlor the body laid out on the couch. She remembered suddenly that the parlor had seemed to contain the presence of Jim. She had looked up and seen dimly what seemed the figure and face of her dead husband. In the eyes that seemed to be laughing, she read the threat. I took him, but now there's you. As these recollections flooded and flowed through her mind, a frightened nervousness seized upon Martha, standing by the window. Somehow she was being held by a fear to move. Something seemed to have robbed her of the strength and resolution to turn away from the window. There came to her the impression that there was someone in the room with her. The feeling grew subtle upon her, and added to her fear of turning around. So she kept her eyes looking out of the window up where the shaft of the gravestone stood. But more clearly now than before, she sensed something that seemed to reach out from the gravestone and carry to her, and at the same time there grew a feeling that the presence in the room was approaching her. She was held in fright. All her nervous impulses impelled her to flight. Like a whip that was descending over her head came the mirage from the gravestone until, in a mad, wild attempt to evade it, she flung about in the room, as if to dash across and away from the window. Suddenly she was halted in her passage by the presence of Jim. The dim parlor was somehow filled with the sense of his being there, and in the dusk near the mantelpiece, and at the head of the couch, there stood in shadowy outline her husband, come back. 
Jim, she uttered in a frightened grasp, and threw her hands outward to protect herself from his purpose. But she saw clearly the shadowy face and eyes that said unmistakably, I have come for you. She was terror-bound. There was no advance, for moving forward meant coming closer to that presence, meant walking into his very grasp. She was about to speak, to plead for herself, to beg. Jim, leave me. In her terror and dread of his approach, she turned hastily to the window and leapt down. Wildly she scrambled up, bruised and shaken and screaming hoarsely, while in unthinking terror she moved her hands, as if to beat off unwelcome hands. She ran pantingly up the road, which led to Deem's house. The silence and the air of happy quietness that filled the house of her friends seemed to lay a spell upon Martha. Caring for her, as if she were of the household, Deems and his wife were gratified by the change that apparently was coming over their charge. In their room, after Martha had bid them good night, Deems questioned his wife. And how is Martha behaving now? You couldn't tell she was the same woman. Remember how she was when we found her at the door that night, all mumbling and frightened so that she couldn't talk? Well, now she's calm and happy-like. What she needed was being with someone. The quietness of her surroundings had had its effect on Martha. They showed in the calm self-possession with which she walked about persisting in her efforts to help Mrs. Lennon in her household work. The atmosphere of bustling activity, Deems coming and going from the village, from the cemetery, whither he went with his trowel and spade to keep in repairs the many graves and plots on the hillside, all this seemed to have drawn on some reservoir of unsuspected vitality and composure within Martha. These were the visible effects. In fact, however, there had grown in Martha's mind a plan, a desire to cut herself forever free from Jim's sinister possession. And this plan she fed from a reservoir of nervous power that was fear and terror converted into cunning and despair. She went about the house not as if relieved of the fear of Jim, but cautiously, as if somewhere in the back of her mind was a way out, a way out, to win, which required care and careful watchfulness. In this spirit she observed Deem's movement about the house, until she learned where he left his lantern and the box where he put away his trowel and mallet and chisel. Now that the plan was clear in her own mind, there was nothing to do but carry it out. She would cut the dreadful tie that held her to Jim, the tie, the potency of which gave the dead man the power of holding her so completely. Reckoning thus, she became wary of her companions, as if fearing that they might in some way interfere with her plans if they got wind of them. She knew that her every move was watched, for she found that Mrs. Lennon had constituted herself her guardian. Since her coming to the house, she had never left its shelter, finding at first that companionship and reassurance which gave her courage and resolution against Jim, and the power to survive the terror of thought of him, and finding finally that, with the formation of her plan, she would have to conceal it from Deems and his wife. She came to this conclusion in this wise. One day, in the kitchen, she came upon a newly sharpened cleaver, its edge invisibly thin, and its broad, flat side gleaming in the sun. Mrs. Lennon was by the window, and from without came the sounds of Dean chopping wood. Her mind was filled with a sudden clearness of thought, and, swinging the cleaver in the air, she said to Mrs. Lennon, You know, here's how I can break away from Jim. When he reaches out, reaches out for me, I can just cut off his hand. Mrs. Lennon stood motionless, startled by the unexpected word. She had thought Martha's mind free of all fears of Jim. She was brought up sharply by this sudden speech and gesture. Deems, she cried, 
Deems, come here. Deems had taken the cleaver hastily from Martha's hand, and that night told his wife that Martha would have to be watched closely. He feared that Martha was becoming deranged. Martha had discovered that she was watched when one night she left her room. She heard the door open, and instantly she felt the hands of Mrs. Lennon on her arm, and heard a gentle, persuasive voice asking her to return to bed. It was the next day, in the dusk in the turn of a hallway, that Martha once more felt the presence of Jim. If her life in the peaceful household of her friends had brought an outward calm, a mantle of repose and quiet. This was instantly torn up by the vision that formed before her eyes in the half-dim hallway. Instantly, she was the old Martha, held in the grasp of terror. Her face was drawn in tense, white lines. Her lips were deformed, and with trembling, gaunt hands she thrust back the apparition. Her scream, Jim, let me be, let me be, brought Mrs. Lennon running, and called Deems from his work in the woodshed. They found her in a faint on the floor. They carried her to her room and put her to bed, Mrs. Lennon speaking to her, soothing, and trying to bring back her former calm. There followed a few days of rain, which seemed in some way to make Martha less uneasy and restless. Deems and his wife, seeing her silent, and apparently resting, felt that slowly the terror she had been suffering was being washed out. Martha's attitude encouraged this feeling. She rested in silence, attentive to the dropping of the rain, and learned once more to wear her old-time composure. When Deems returned toward nightfall one day, it was with the news that the incessant rain had done serious damage in the cemetery. Dripping from the drenching he had received in his tour of inspection, his boots muddy, and his hands dirty from holding on to precarious bushes, he shook with cold as he reported on what he had found. In his narrative, he had quite forgotten the presence of Martha, who sat by, silent and waxen-faced. And you ought to see it, he said, turning to his wife, how the rain has run down those graves. You know, it's loosened Jim Sloan's stone so. I'm afraid it'll fall against the first heavy blow. Martha exclaimed, Oh! recalling to him her presence. He stopped talking for a while. Then, hoping to blot out the effects of his statement, he began a lively story of the number of trees that had fallen across the road, and how he had been told that over in Rampico, the post office had been struck by lightning. He did not know it, but Martha was deaf to his reports. She had her own thoughts. She felt herself curiously strong of will, and there raced in her blood a high determination to act that very night. Not for nothing had she spent the rain-drenched days in terrified silence in her room. All her energies that were still capable of being mustered to her resolve, she had converted in the crucible of her will, and huddled in terror, she had forged the determination to go out when the time came, and to cut herself free of the fiendish power that was searing her mind and slowly crushing her. She remembered that in her faint, when she lay limp and inert, a thing of dread, she had felt herself crumble up at the touch of Jim. Jim reached out to her. Now she would cut herself free of him at the very source of his power over her. She would go that very night. She cast a glance toward the closet, where Deems kept his trowel and chisel. She would have need of them, she knew. She said, Good night, rather more loudly and vehemently than she had intended, for she was feeling nervous. She was awakened by a feeling of cold. As she sat up, she saw the door was open. What was it that drew her eyes toward the hallway? and out into the open, and brought her up suddenly. There came upon her an eeriness that startled and chilled her, and suddenly, as if it were coming at her through the open door, fingers out thrust, there appeared a hand. She was out of bed instantly. 
Somehow in her throat she repressed an upstartled cry, Jim, by an effort that strained all her nerves and made her face bloodless white. She could not, however, repress completely the instinctive movement of her hands to ward off the menacing hand. Suddenly a panic seized her, and in terrified haste she moved to the closet and, feeling a moment, took what she knew was Dean's chisel. Do what she could, she could not stem the flow of panic, and suddenly, as she began to pant and breathe heavily with the strain of terror, she began also to gasp her pleadings to Jim. Don't, Jim! Don't take me! And, as if not at all of her own volition, but at that of a guiding power, she moved out of the house, ghastly in the night, mumbling and shivering. She stood a tremble. She was now chilled by the dampness of the ground and air. Then she stood by Jim Sloan's gravestone. White it gleamed against the sky, and now Martha's trembling and murmuring turned into a furious industry as she raised the chisel to the stone. Jim, you'll let me be, won't you? You'll let me be. I want to live yet. She began a frenzied hacking at the gravestone, seeing nothing but the play of her chisel, and the white, fearful stone towering over her, hearing nothing but the rasp of the chisel, not even hearing the rattle of the loose gravel as it slid from under the stone. Deems Lennon and his wife were awakened by a heavy crash. "'What can it be?' he asked his wife, and then left the bed and ran up to Martha's room. She was gone. Instantly they were both fully awake. It's Jim's grave. She's gone to it, ventured Deems. Remember the way she said, Oh, that time when I told how the rain had loosened the stone? Come on, we'll go see. In the dark, when they were near the spot where the stone used to stand, they heard a moaning. They approached and found Martha caught under the stone, her body crushed, her dying breath coming slowly and heavily, carrying her words, let me go, Jim. Let me go. The End of The Stone by Henry Goodman